Okay, I'm Don Ross. I was um, I did my PhD in philosophy of science, um, but I've been I've variously held posts in philosophy and economics for the last 20 years. Um, at the moment, I was in a philosophy department as recently as 2010, but at the moment I'm exclusively in two economics departments. Um, He's a dean. I'm also, <laughs> yes. So, um, in, I've been interested in the unification of economics with other sciences, and by that I don't just mean analytic unification. In fact, I don't mean analytic unification at all. Uh, I mean understanding both large and small economic systems as the, as the information processing systems that they are, and understanding how such information processing systems fit into the larger domain of information processing systems in the world. Um, the, in, I also have recently written a book with the philosopher of physics, James Ladyman, called Everything Must Go, uh, Metaphysics Naturalized. And the, um, the argument of that book is that um, philosophers, for the most part, analytic philosophers particularly, have failed to really promote naturalism in, and, 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 and give it its proper innings because of lingering commitments to pre-scientific worldviews. So even, even many of the philosophers who are most vociferous in insisting, the David Lewis, for example, who are most vociferous in insisting uh, that they take contemporary physics seriously, seem to us not to take contemporary physics seriously at all. Right? That what we actually find, and, and, and we try to diagnose a specific set of commitments that we find in, in most analytic philosophy, of, in, in analytic metaphysics specifically, um, which is a commitment to the idea that the world is ultimately made of little things and the dynamics and processes in the world result from those little things crashing into each other, that those little things are, have the distinctness independently of, of models of the world as a whole. Um, so the book starts with a sustained attack on analytic philosophy, uh, analytic metaphysics. We argue that it's as practiced in the world's best philosophy departments right now, it's virtually all nonsense. It virtually all presupposes demonstrably false physics. Um, we then have a couple of chapters on quantum field theory, um, arguing that, trying to show how the quantum field theory is in fact inconsistent with the presuppositions of most analytic metaphysics. Then a couple of chapters in which we've tackled the problem, well, so if we take real physics seriously instead of the um, stylized fake physics of analytic metaphysics, what about the special sciences? What are the status of, what are the status of, the, they look like they're about objects of various kinds. They seem to be generalizing over classes of objects. Uh, in the earlier chapters, we've rejected reductionist accounts of those objects, but at the same time, naturalism, we also have, we also argue against so-called disunity theories. So we argue the world, it is, it is one of the set th reasonable things to ask of science that it provide us with a general worldview. Uh, and a general worldview implies a, wor a view of one world. So <clears throat> if one takes real physics seriously, what about special sciences? So <clears throat> we deal with that in an information theoretic, um, using information theoretic mathematics. Um, though I'm not as satisfied with those, cha those chapters really are way stations because uh, they're basically, they're, they're in English. Uh, and <laughs> one of our arguments is we really can't expect, we shouldn't expect to be able to say true and interesting things about the general structure of the universe in natural language. Um, but at least we do in that, we do try to do it in, in that, at that point of the, in, in, in that point of our dialectic, we uh, are still talking to philosophers in one sense. We're trying to show how we've got alternative views consistent with our new foundations of the favorite topics of analytic metaphysicians. So, um, uh, but in, we're now in the pro business of writing a more popular and accessible version of that book, which we hope to have out in a few years, because uh, the now current one me. is pretty formidable. <laughs> Sorry? Now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're already doing the work for us, Massimo, so maybe we can, yeah. Um, so that, I'll, I'll stop in a minute. The, the, other, the other main thing we do, I'm not, this, this may or may not be, turn out to, well, I'm sure I will at some point say things that, that 
come from this base. So I just mentioned that we do it. I run an experimental economics lab at the University of Cape Town, um, which also has it's partnered with Georgia State University. Uh, we don't do behavioral economics in the sense most people are familiar with. That is, we're not trying to extract psychological properties of individual people. We do experiments with large groups of people uh, because we're interested in the in, in economic information processing dynamics at the population level. Uh, we do sometimes put people in fMRI scanners, but even there, we're not interested in estimating their individual properties. We've got some fancy some fancy econometrics for scaling up to populations. Uh, as for things that I could change my mind about, um, I hope that I will change my mind. I'm looking forward to changing my mind about philosophy of mathematics because I have a different philosophy of mathematics every month. Uh, um, so I'm sure I'm not going to get through three days of talking with all you people and come out with the one I started, I came in with.